Will you welcome with me Dr. Temple Grandin to Utah State University? Let's give her an Aggie welcome. Out of, out of respect for Dr. Grandin, we ask that there be no flash photography. So she's expressed an interest. You can take pictures, but please turn your flash uh, devices off. Thank you. Okay, you can do all the flash pictures you want afterwards, but it just drives me crazy during my talk. Well, good. At least my slides are up there and look like they're working. I think I'll start out and just say, talk a little bit about what exactly autism is. Autism is a developmental disorder where some of the social circuits don't get hooked up in the brain. Well, at one end of the spectrum, you're going to have somebody that's going to remain nonverbal. But at the other end of the spectrum, you've got Steve Jobs. I've been reading all of the information on Steve Jobs, and I'm pretty sure he's on the spectrum. <laughs> Einstein had no language until age three. Many school systems would put him on the spectrum. So at one end of the spectrum, you've got somebody who's not very social, but they've got extra geek circuits and circuits for doing um, well, I think the really fun stuff, you know, like designing equipment, building things, doing engineering, writing, all the good fun stuff. It's a very, very big spectrum. And it's also a continuous trait. When the slightly geeky become mild autism, there's no black and white dividing line. And, you know, if you get rid of all the genetics that made autism, if your computer breaks, uh, you're not going to have anybody to fix it. Because half of Silicon Valley is probably on the spectrum. Oh, now why is that just jumping forward? Now the thing is, I want to get you to understand thinking without words. But there's a whole realm of thinking where there isn't words. Animals, I think completely in pictures. And the HBO movie did an absolutely fantastic job of showing how my visual thinking mind works. You want to understand animal behavior. You've got to get away from language. There's this whole world of sensory detail. The thing is, the animal's world is sensory-based, it's not word-based. And it's also very detailed, a world of visual pictures, of smells, of touch sensations. And if you have somebody on the autism spectrum that's really severe, touch and smell may actually be the only senses that work. Seeing and hearing may be like all jumbled up. Hearing might be like a really bad cell phone that's just fading in and out. Or, You've got the satellite dish that's shaking and the, and the picture's pixelating. You can get problems like that in the visual system. What I want to try to get you to think about is how other kinds of minds think. That there's other kinds of thinking. Now when Van Gogh painted this painting, I don't think he realized that he was putting mathematical patterns into Starry Night. You know, he doesn't know anything about mathematics, but the mathematicians got a hold of this. And it turned out that this follows a mathematical pattern of water turbulence. There's kind of a whole world that's underneath language. Mathematical things and visual things. Now this picture came from a patient that had type of Alzheimer's that destroys the frontal cortex of the brain. Then it wrecks the language part of the brain. And after the language part of the brain gets wrecked, then you get some art. And then after a while the whole brain is ruined and you lose the art too. Now the thing about the autistic mind, and there's a lot of other labels too. You know, you can get dis people that are dyslexic, they got nonverbal learning disability, they got sensory processing disorder, they got ADHD, they got ADD, you know, all these different labels. There's an awful lot of crossover. You know, and a lot of these labels are behavioral profiles. Um, you know, maybe today Einstein would be labeled very severely autistic kid, no hope. And uh, in the past, he was labeled you know, genius and mathematician. Now, the thing is, person on the spectrum tends to notice details. See, all my thinking is into details. It's what's called bottom-up thinking. I make a concept by putting lots of details together. Now, here's a classic test of looking at the whole versus looking at the details. And the person on the spectrum will pick out the details, the little letters, a lot quicker than the big letters. It's all about details. Now, there's been some research that shows 
some very interesting things about the normal mind. And there's been a lot of brain scan data that's been done. And one detail that got left out is this guy's got a brain tumor, so I probably wasn't a very good slide to put in this PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> and uh, that's a little detail that got left out right there. And I get a big laugh out of it, so that's why I didn't change that slide, because you'll think it's kind of funny. But if you take a person with autism and you put them in a brain scanner and you have them read, just the, the part of the brain that gets the words turns on. You take someone with just a mild autism, the part that does the words and the overall whole turns on. But you put the normal person in, guess what happens? You lose the detail of the words. The normal mind tends to oversimplify and drop out the details. Well, if you're building a bridge, you need to have details. I find when I'm trying to troubleshoot things, I don't care if it's problems with equipment at a meatpacking plant, whether it is, um, you know, a child has trouble in the classroom or it's an animal behavior problem. People will just say something vague, like there's a behavior problem in the classroom. My dog's nuts. Well, I don't know what that means. Is he wagging his tail all happy when you come home? Or is he biting somebody? You know, that's not giving me any information about what they mean by it's nuts. Now, sometimes the most obvious is the least obvious. Okay, in my cattle handling work, some of the first thing I did was to get down in the chutes and see what cattle were seeing. Now, in this situation, the cattle didn't want to go into this um, veterinary facility. And all that was wrong is they could see the flag waving there. Well, rapid movement, high contrast of light and dark. It uh, seems that obvious. But sometimes things that are obvious are not obvious. See, I'm a total visual thinker. And I just couldn't believe it when I read all the stuff about the accident with the Japanese nuclear power plant. Why, when you live by the sea and you got no backup for the seawall, you'd put your generators that run the really important emergency pumps in the basement. Because guess what happened to the generators? The water came in there and they drowned. And the emergency pump did not work. And that's why four nuclear reactors blew up. Because they didn't see. You see, and I think part of the problem is they actually didn't see it. This is where I want to get you to think about different kinds of thinking. Look at how that animal is looking right at that little blob of sunlight. You know, when I first started working on this cattle stuff, people thought that was really crazy to even be looking at what cattle were looking at. Well, you see, he's looking right at it. I'd get down in the chutes and see what they were seeing. When there were shadows, they were scared. When they see the people up here, they'd get scared. I get asked all the time, do cows know they're going to die at the meatpacking plant? I had to figure that out really, really early in my career. <coughs> and I'd watch how they behaved at the plant, and I'd watch how they behaved out at a veterinary chute. They behaved the same way in both places. And I found if you lit up an, a, a bright, if you made the chute entrance bright with a light, then they weren't scared. If it was too dark, they wouldn't go in. If there's a chain hanging down, they wouldn't go in. If there's equipment going by, they wouldn't go in. And if I got rid of these things, then they would just walk right in. They were afraid of little things that we tended to not notice, little rapid movement, things like that. Now look at how the horse and the zebra have an ear on each other. Watch where the animals are pointing their ears. Seems obvious. One thing I always train the veterinary students is I want you to be observant. If you've got nice, soft brown eyes, your animal's calm. You've got white eyes uh, popping out, that, that horse or that cow's really upset. In dogs, wagging the tail means they're happy. Well, in cattle and horses, it means they're getting scared. Now, I'm a complete visual thinker. It's literally movies in my head. I can't think about anything without having a picture in my mind. And it's a very specific picture in my mind. I don't think about things in generalities. That's not how I think. Now, I realized my thinking was different when I asked people to think about a church steeple. And I was shocked to find out that most people got this very vague, generalized uh, picture. I only see specific ones. So why did I ask church steeple rather than house or car? Because if I ask house or car, most people will see their own home or their own car. But I ask them something they don't own, but they see them every day, they tend to get a much more generalized sort of image. This was a shock to me. And I discovered this when I wrote my book, Thinking in Pictures, which unfortunately the university bookstores run out of it already. 
but um, I am signing book plates and uh, they're taking orders for, for the book. Or you can buy them on Amazon. But it was really, really shocking to me to discover that other people didn't think the same way that I think. And I'm getting very interested in different ways that people think. Because people that think different ways can work together and do really, really great projects. You know, they need a visual thinker like me to design the safety system for nuclear power plants. <laughs> because um, I wouldn't put the generators in the basement, not unless I had submarine waterproof doors. <laughs> because uh, they just don't work very well underneath the water, and the pump probably didn't have a waterproof motor, so it's not going to work. All the power board's wet. Talking about a complete mess here. Okay. The pictures kind of flash up in my mind like Google for images. You know, they just kind of flash up like this. You know, a bunch of different pictures. And I can stop on one of those pictures and say, would you like a snowstorm there? Would you like a, a, you know, rain, you know, sunset? I didn't know other people couldn't think this way. Now, being a complete visual thinker who can actually test run equipment in my mind was a real asset in designing equipment because I could design something and I could visualize how it can work. And I'm visualizing all the different ways that water would fill up the basement in that plant. Okay, if it has a louvered side, it would come in like two seconds. If they had steel doors, they might hold for a few minutes before they break. Probably gonna break. Uh, all the different, the way the, that I visualized how the water's gonna puddle against the other side of the seawall, right there on the plant site, six foot of water puddled there, that's gonna be a mess. That's not going to drain away, drain away too quickly. And there's an aerial photo of the dipping vat system that they used in the movie. One thing I loved in the movie is they duplicated all my projects absolutely exactly. They showed sensory sensitivity problems. They showed how I was um, anxious all the time. Horrible problems with anxiety. And that anxiety now is controlled with antidepressant medication. And in my books, Thinking in Pictures, and then the way I see it, second edition. I've got a whole lot of stuff in there about medication. And I'm absolutely horrified at how they're giving five-year-olds powerful antipsychotic drugs, making them fat, giving them nerve damage. It's just shocking. You know, there's a place of medication. Because I wouldn't be here right now with a little bit of help from antidepressants. Now, I know a lot of people where a little tiny dab of Prozac can really, really make a big difference. <laughs> but there's way too much given out to little kids like candy. Let's start off with more exercise, eating less sugar, maybe that might be a good idea. And there's my drawings. Now when you're a real weird geek, nobody wanted to talk to me because I was totally weird. So the way I sold jobs was showing off my drawings. And when I showed them one of my drawings, they go, oh wow, you did that? Well, maybe we should talk to you after all. And there's the uh, dipping vat system. And in my 20s, one of the things that really motivated me is I wanted to prove to people I wasn't stupid. And when I did the project at the Red River Feed Yard, using this drawing right here, I remember getting these drawings all done and I almost couldn't believe that I drew them. I get, well, I guess I'm not stupid. If I was able to design things that really work. Now I teach a class in livestock handling. And I've been noticing some really interesting things about perception. This shows a basic curved cattle handling facility. And you might wonder why is it curved? Cattle have a natural tendency to go back to where they come from. But one of the things I had to learn how to do is how to look at a blueprint and relate the lines on the drawing to the actual thing. If I got a big circle on a drawing, that might be a water tower. If I have a series of little squares, that might be concrete columns that hold up the building. How do I relate the, the drawing to the real thing? So there's the real thing. And I find I have to help my students learn that. So I'll switch back and forth between the drawing and the real thing, so that they can start to see it. Now, I found some real weird things happening when I watched the meat industry go from hand drafting to computers. I've worked with every single major meat company. And the old folks switching over to computers, that worked fine. But I saw certain young people come in and making weird perceptual mistakes on drawings. They didn't know where the center of the circle was. Uh, they wouldn't swing the gates. They didn't know which way the gates swung. They put 25-foot gates in a pig stockyard. That couldn't possibly work. They weren't seeing the drawings. And in every case that I found this problem, it was like a guy in his 20s, never built anything by hand, 
and he had never drawn by hand. You see, in order to understand things, you've got to feel it. And I had a chance to go out to Pixar, and I've been to other really creative places like Disney Imagineering. Really, really, really fun places to go to. And they have this thing called a 3D printer. So when they draw something like Buzz Lightyear, the 3D printer can actually make a little resin statue of Buzz. And then I go, I look at it, and I go, why do these people have all these little resin statues around their computer so they can hold them? Because if you don't get the feedback at touch, your drawings get messed up. And I've talked to a number of animation places about that. You've got to touch stuff, really understand what you're seeing. I can't emphasize enough working with kids and with students, building up the ability area. A lot of little kids with autism are good at drawing. Others are not. They're good at drawing. Let's work on improving that. Well, when I was a little kid, all I wanted to do was draw horse heads all the time. Well, mother suggested, let's do the entire horse. Why don't you do the stable? You want, to, you want to broaden it out. If the kid likes trains, let's do reading with trains. Let's do math with trains. Hook into that motivation and that fixation and broaden it out and broaden it out. You don't want to stomp it out. What you want to do is broaden it out. Because art was the basis of my career. You know, I use my art skills to design things. And the thing is, people on the spectrum, skills tend to be uneven. Good at one thing, bad at something else. Now, I used to joke around that I had a huge uh, internet uh, connection going deep into my visual cortex. This is some imaging that was done at the University of Pittsburgh, and it turns out that I do. Now, you cannot do this imaging at the local hospital. None of this stuff was done at a hospital. Don't even be bothered with that. You know, let's look at what, where the kid has a problem. What's the kid good at? And then you work on treating the actual problems. And take a slice up here. I've got an even bigger trunk line. Now I want to show you another kind of mind. Because I've now I've figured out that there's two kinds of visual thinking. And there's actual research to support this. I've been digging up research and working on another book right now on on uh, different types of cognition. And I'm a photorealistic visual thinker. But another kind of thinker is the pattern thinker. This is the mathematician. They think in patterns. They're very good at those space relation kind of tests. Some of those I'm not that good at. Now, that praying mantis is made out of a single sheet of folded paper. No cutting and no scotch tape. And what you see in the background is the folding pattern for making the praying mass. Now, that's not how I think. Now, here's a really important slide. Because people in the, aut in the autism spectrum have different kinds of minds. And people with a lot of different labels have different kinds of minds. But different kinds of minds can work together. A person like me can visualize things. I need to work together with a nuclear power plant designers so we don't have any more of these kind of horrendous big messes. Let's take an example of, um, of something like the, um, the iPod. Steve Jobs was not an engineer. He was an artist. And if you go look his patents up on Google, they're all about the user interface. Why do computers have nice fonts? Because after Steve Jobs dropped out of Reed College, he sat in on a calligraphy class and got so fascinated with calligraphy, that's why computers have nice fonts. It was all about the user experience. It wasn't, a, and the engineer has to make the insides work. So in other words, to make a really nice personal computer, Steve Jobs made the user interface and made sure the case was really pretty too. And the engineers have got to make the insides work. That's the two kinds of thinkers working together. Let's take another situation, different kinds of minds working together. And that would be the Lion King show. Wonderful show. They hired Julia Taymor. She made all these gorgeous costumes. Fantastic show. You can tour it without spending a fortune, which is also really important. And the thing is, is that Julie had to stay with the Disney script. You see, that gave her the linear story. Because the problem with the visual thinker is your mind jumps all around this associative. She had to stay with the Disney story. That's a great show. Spider-Man had quite a few problems, like gigantic cost overruns because there was no co-writer there to make the story part. 
See, this is an example of the two kinds of minds working together. And then another Apple product, the iPhone 4, had a few problems with reception because pretty trumped antenna design 101. <laughs> and the reason why you have to have a case on an iPhone 4 is because if you put your hand right against the antenna, it doesn't work very well. Well, you see, the two kinds of minds there need to work together a little bit better. And I've worked on projects where I've worked really well with someone that's a different kind of mind. I've used co-authors on some of my animal books because it helps organize me. Visual thinkers aren't that organized. You see, different kinds of minds are good at doing different kinds of things. Now, on the autism spectrum, the kind of kid that tends to be the verbal thinker is the history lover. They love history. Let's look at jobs for these different kinds of minds. But my kind of mind is industrial designer, it's photographer, it's um, a graphic designer, uh, just all kinds of jobs involving visual thinking. And for the pattern thinking mind, it's going to be mathematics, engineering, computers, those kinds of things, word minds, they're good at writing. And we've got to start working on job skills. Middle school, that's when you need to start teaching job skills. And I've, there's a lot of people on the autism spectrum that are my age, they're all undiagnosed. And some get diagnosed because their marital relationships aren't good, but they've managed to hold jobs, keep jobs and hold them. Because when they were in middle school, they were doing things like paper routes. When I was 13, mother had me do a little sewing job two afternoons a week. When I was 15, I took care of nine horses. Also, when I was 15, mother gave me the chance to go out to my aunt's ranch. I was afraid to go. And she said, well, you can go for a week or you can go all summer. We got to keep stretching. I'm seeing too many parents where they're kind of coddling these kids. Smart, fully verbal 12 year olds, a lot less severe than me, that don't know how to order food at McDonald's. That's ridiculous. By the time I was 12 years old, I could do all kinds of shopping stuff and I could do it all by myself. Another thing I'm seeing that I don't like is I'm seeing a smart kid get all fixated on his autism rather than getting fixated on something like history or something like computers or engineering something that can turn into a job. Now, how do you form a concept when you have all these specific pictures? It's bottom-up thinking. You take and you put pictures into different categories. It's bottom-up thinking, not top-down. You gotta teach everything by specific example. So how did I learn something like rude behavior? Okay, point at a fat lady at the supermarket, rude. Well, let's say that's rude, don't do that. Stick out your tongue at church, rude, don't do that. It's everything is specific example. You want to teach them not to run across the street? You need to do it in several different places. Then they'll get the concept. It's bottom up thinking, it's not top down. Dogs will also have categories. When I'm on the leash, I can uh, protect my owner. And when I'm off the leash, I can go play. Cattle do the same thing. Man on a horse and a man on the ground. Cows will view that as two different things. You can have cattle where they're nice and tame with a horse and rider, and then when you walk out in the pen, they got a 50 foot flight zone and they're running away. But think about it man on a horse, man on the ground, it's a different picture. Much more specific in their thinking. I want to get you to think about that. Both animals and people on the autism spectrum are bottom up thinkers. You got to sort of fight the way you think. One of the reasons why I think we have so much problems in government today is we got people making policy that have no practical experience with the things that they're making policy about. It's all become <laughs> totally and absolutely abstract. Now, how do I understand something really abstract like all the money spent on the first bailout? You know what I did? I got to convert that to something I can understand. Uh, Denver International Airport units. Because a Denver airport costs five billion to build. So 100 billion is 20 airports. And that bailout was equal to two airports for every single state. Okay, now I can get my head around it. I think that's better than saying how many seconds it is or something like that. Because airports are real things. You know, that money can buy. 
Now, learn concepts. It's kind of awkward and I can't see my slides. Everything I learn by putting specific examples into file folders. And then that's how I make my concepts. Dogs go in one file folder, cats go in another file folder. And when I was little, I had to figure out why a dachshund was not a cat, because I no longer sort by size. But every dog, no matter how little, has exactly the same nose. Let's teach concepts like up. You go up the hill. The kite flies up in the air. A plane goes up. You've got to teach up with a no of various different things. Then they'll understand it. Let's teach concepts like money and counting. You can have two bottles, two pencils, two people, two dogs, two houses, two airplanes. Both big and small things, living things. You can have two flowers, two blades of grass. Then they'll teach fractions by cutting up the pizza. That's fractions, cutting up the piece of fruit. Cooking is a great place to teach proportions. Now the thing about animals is they'll often get very specific fears. Like this horse got afraid of people wearing black hats because when he was abused, he was abused by a person wearing a black hat. White hats were fine. See, it's a picture. It's real specific. I, we were just having some discussions this afternoon about a really nice Tennessee walking horse. Beautiful to ride, but he'd kick and try to bite when you go to put the cinch on. And the reason for that is somebody abused him. And he learned everything else is safe, but when they go to put the cinch on, tighten up the cinch, I've had bad things happen. You see, that's very specific. And you can sometimes get sensory issues with kids with autism, where loud sounds hurt their ears, and they may get afraid of a smoke alarm. Even if they just see one now, they get afraid of it. Because he's afraid it's going to blast his ears out. We need to work with the different kinds of minds and, and work on how different kinds of minds can work together. Because who do you think made the first stone spear? It wasn't the yak yaks around the campfire. <laughs> and I think that brains can be made to either be more social or brains can be made more cognitive. And I think there's a big range where some of it's just normal variation. And then there's a point where it gets to be more extreme and then you really do have a true handicap because there was probably some Asperger guy that chipped away at a rock and made the first stone spear. It wasn't the yak yaks, that's for sure. I want you to think about different kinds of thinking. It was a shock to me to find out that most other people didn't think in pictures quite the way I did. Then it was interesting for me to find out how there was another kind of visual thinking. The mathematical thinking and photorealistic visual thinking are two different types of visual thinking. And I've been digging up research on this. Now the only thing that's different between so-called normal people and someone on the spectrum or someone with ADHD is this tendency to have uneven skills tends to be more extreme. People that are so-called normal, it's more even. Skills are more even. But there needs to be a lot more emphasis on building up the area of strength. That's what we need to be doing. We've got to help the students that are kind of different to be successful. What I'm finding is people get way too hung up on labels. Because when I go out in the technical field, there's a meat plant, it's a big one, great big meat plant, where they have a plant engineer and all the maintenance staff I'm sure is on the spectrum. They don't know they're on the spectrum. Half of Silicon Valley's on the spectrum. You know, the thing that worries me is I'm seeing some of these smart kids getting held back by labels because the word-based thinkers can't think of them any other way. But, you know, like um, I went over to the spectrum school yesterday and there was a whole bunch of kids there. And then I go up to the Minnesota State Science Fair. Guess what? Saw all the same kind of little kids. <laughs> and a few of them were diagnosed and the rest weren't. You know, it's, I, I see the kids. I don't, I don't, I'm not a verbal thinker. Okay, mentoring. I can't emphasize enough the importance of my science teacher and how much my science teacher helped me. He was shown beautifully in the movie. Now, I was getting a lot of work skills in high school, but I wasn't interested in studying. I just didn't see any reason to study. And he got me turned on. And then I actually did build that optical illusion room. And they showed the actual movie clip from a Bell Labs film on optical illusions that I saw back in the 60s. We got to show kids interesting things. We got to get them out and show them interesting things. Too many boys are getting addicted to video games. Well, maybe we need to show them that oil rigs have got joysticks too. There's all kinds of interesting stuff out there. 
Let's look at where the jobs are at. Well, the oil rigs, they're going crazy right now looking for certified welders, skilled trades, nursing jobs. There's areas where there's actual job shortages. We've got to start thinking a lot more about how we're going to get people employed and learning uh, basic skills. I think it's a shame schools have taken out so many of the hands-on classes. I think it's absolutely terrible. And they say, well, we've got to teach to the test. Well, that's a bunch of BS. Because there's schools doing lots of hands-on things, and they're acing international tests. You know, work the mathematics into the cooking class, or into the welding class, or auto shop. Another place where there's a shortage of jobs right now is auto mechanic and diesel mechanic. There's a shortage. In engineering, the kind of engineers they really want is electrical, computer science, mixed together in the same guy. Those are really, really scarce right now. You know, I think educators need to get out and start working with employers. We've got that big oil refinery down there in Salt Lake. I'd be inclined to call that plant manager up and talk to them, what kind of workers do you need? You probably you need skilled trades here. You can't just have any dingling working on an oil refinery. <laughs> well, there I am doing some of my things I really like doing in high school. Another thing about the hands-on things is that they were only places where I was not teased. The kids that did the teasing didn't go to horseback riding, they didn't go to model rocket club or electronics. We need to get these kids that are kind of different. Let's say kids with brains that are kind of different. Let's get them into art club, computer club, robotics club, boy scouts, girl scouts. These are really, really great activities to get them in because then they're with peers with a shared interest. You've got to tap into those interests. Okay, let's talk some about sensory issues. Many, many, many different labels have sensory issues. Now, oppositional defiant, I have a difficult time with that being a medical disorder. I am just too much of a hardcore uh, scientific person. Now, sensory issues, you have them in developmental differences because circuits in the brain grow differently. In head injury, you get the same sensory problems, but circuits are just busted up by the head injury. I had problems with sound sensitivity. When loud sounds went off, it was like a dentist drill hitting a nerve. When grown-ups talked really fast, I didn't understand them because I was not able to hear the hard consonant sounds. Teachers need to slow down and enunciate. And when the child's tired, that hearing may be cutting in and out like a bad cell phone. Well, it'd be pretty hard to follow the lessons if it was like a bad cell phone. Uh, and there's one place where research is really needed is treatment for sensory issues. But the problem with sensory issues is they're very variable. One kid labeled ADHD has a sound sensitivity problem, another one doesn't. Autism and ADHD and ADD, that's mixed up all the time. In fact, there's a new book out called Bright Not Broken. That's about really smart, gifted kids that have other labels. There's a big discussion in Bright Not Broken about um, all the whole diagnostic mess. And I'll tell you right now, it's not precise. These labels are behavioral profiles. You know, if somebody has multiple sclerosis, yeah, that's a real thing with a real diagnosis. Or somebody has cerebral palsy and there's a problem with the way they move. Yeah, that is, you know, exactly what that is. But they've got so many of these different labels. I, you know, you say, was well, a kid pervasive developmental disorder or is he autism? You know what, it doesn't matter because the services they're going to need are the same. But we need to be doing research on these sensory issues because they vary from a nuisance to being very, very, very debilitating. And one of the ways to help on sound sensitivity is let the child initiate the sound. You know, if a horn bothers him, let him honk the horn. Now there's a little boy putting his hands over his ears. I can relate to that. And then there's some individuals where they get in the middle of the supermarket and they feel like they're inside the speaker at the rock concert. They're just not able to tolerate it. Another difficulty, and the reason why I didn't want all the flash photography, is I have some difficulties with attention shifting slowness. And I have to say, this kid over here making some noise. Uh, and <laughs> mother would have had me in a lot of trouble for that. Uh, I have a very, very, very difficult time blocking that out because it attracts my attention 
and then I, then I shift my attention back. It's real, real difficult. Tension shifting slowness. You can get that with head injury, and you can get it with many, many, many different labels. The processing speed of the brain slows down. And if you have a, somebody with a really slow processing speed, you can get clipping. Like you might say, Tommy, hang up your jacket. Maybe he just heard jacket because the first part of the sentence is clipped. So you want to say, Tommy, I need to tell you something. Then you say, hang up the jacket. Multitasking, I, there's a lot of entry level jobs that involve multitasking. That's just not going to work for me. Um, high level things like doing design work, I don't have to do any multitasking. Some kids, when they go to read, they might be labeled dyslexia, they might be labeled non specific learning disorder, they might be labeled a whole bunch of different things. I am finding in my livestock handling class, where I have my students do a drawing, out of 50 or 60 students in that class every year, I find one or two students with this problem. You talk to them, they'll say the print jiggles on the page. This is going to really mess up reading. This is common. And they absolutely cannot draw. Let me tell you some simple things, the ways, things for this. Try printing the book on tan paper, gray paper, all the different pastel papers. Some people with this problem love their Kindles because it's kind of a gray background and it reduces the contrast play around with different colored backgrounds on computers, and make sure no TV type computers, they're horrible. You've either got to use a tablet or a laptop. Those are the only screens that don't flicker. And another thing that can help this is the Erlen colored lenses, where you try on maybe pale pink, pale lavender, pale blue, different colored lenses until you find the ones where the print no longer jiggles. And you know, the, thing that you, the problem that you got is if you had 10 kids labeled autistic, maybe only one has this problem. You got 10 kids labeled dyslexia, only one has this problem. You know, all the different fields, whether it's dyslexia, ADHD, autism, nobody reads each other's books. Like you go to the gifted conference, you got a totally different set of books than the autism conference. You go to the ADHD conference, you've got a totally different set of books. That's what we we're trying to do with this Bright Not Broken book, is try to bridge the gap. Because I go to these conferences, I'm going, wait a minute, got some of the same kids here. <laughs> they all had a few books there, and uh, I'll be out at the bookstore. It's run out of books now, but I'll sign some book plates. They can, you can order them through the bookstore. Or there's always good old Amazon, Barnes & Noble. And we're going to open it up now for some questions. Because I always like to do questions, and we're going to have this mic uh, passed around in the audience so that um, people will be able to hear. And if nobody has a question, I'm going to pick somebody. So somebody better get their hand up and have a question. Hi. My son is two years old, and I'm having difficulty with transitioning from one you know, I'm learning so much, he's maybe I... He's only two years he's old. Only normal two. normal two-year-olds have problems with transitioning. However, our entire family has got some autism, and he's already showing signs, and I want to help him early, and the transitions are, are that he fl flings himself to the floor. I don't want him to get hurt and banging his head and that kind of thing. Okay, now what kind of transitions? See, be specific. You're tending okay, to okay, here. okay. Um... Okay. Um, he wants to walk in one direction, um, and I want him to walk back home, and he has it in his head he wants to go that way, so he flings himself to the ground if I try to, to reposition him. Well, some of this is the terrible twos. <laughs> this is a very, very young child. And I saw a three-year-old uh, just the other day at airport security in Denver pitch a really big one on the floor at airport Denver Airport Security. You know, it, it's, uh, now I want to ask you, can this two-year-old talk? That's really important. Now, one of the things you need to be doing with a two-year-old that you think is autism is don't wait. That kid needs at least 20 or 30 hours a week of one-to-one -one interaction with a teacher. Play a lot of turn-taking games. You've got to teach these kids how to take turns. Kids on the spectrum are really, really bad about that. But in the 50s, we had all these board games and all the stuff that was fun to do you had to do with, with somebody else. He needs to have somebody teaching him his words. You may have to be careful about sensory overload. 
And when he pitches a fit, the thing to do is just wait until he calms down. And <coughs> but he's extremely young. And hopefully he'll start to mature out of that. But the one thing that every expert will agree on, the two-year-old or three-year-old that you think might have autism, especially one that doesn't have speech, is they need at least 20 or 30 hours a week of one-to-one -one teaching. Now, if you're in a situation where you can get that service, great. If you can't get that service, you need to go to your church and get some volunteers. And the thing that I have found is that some of these grandmothers or students you might recruit will have a knack on working with these kids. Because if you don't intrude in their world a little bit, they don't advance. But you intrude too much in their world, then they go into sensory shutdown. Some kids, you can kind of grab them by the chin and pull them out of it. Other kids are mono-channel. They're not able to see and hear at the same time. And if you bombard them with both vision and seeing stuff, they get overstimulated. But every expert will agree that you need that 20 or 30 hours a week of one-to-ones. Now, the fight over whether it's ABA or some other program, what I think and what I'm going to say is essential is that 20 or 30 hours a week with an effective teacher. Then it could very well be a volunteer grandmother. And grannies are often really good because they've worked with a lot of different kinds of kids. Okay, right there. Oh, okay. Thank you for coming and speaking to us. Um, what do you think about public school versus a, a project-based home What do I think about system? public school versus home-based? So many things depend upon the particular situation. I get asked all the time about different kinds of schools. And if you're doing a home-based program, I want to make sure that that child is getting chances to socialize with other children. I'm not a big fan of having a bunch of little autistic kids together all learning each other's stims and each other's kinds of bad behavior. <laughs> I don't think that's a good thing. But so many things depend upon the particular school and the particular situation. So the thing I ask parents is, is your child making progress? And if he's making progress, great. But there's other situations where you've got a kid getting teased to death at the local high school and it's obviously not working. I was one of the kids that had to be taken out of a large girls' school because I got kicked out of ninth grade for throwing a book at a girl who teased me. And I went to special school. I still had lots of teasing there. And <coughs> one thing I'll say, socializing with teenagers is not a life skill that I need to have. <laughs> so I would say, follow your own good instincts. Is a child improving? That's the important thing. And if he's not improving, then you might want to try something different. And then we get into things like little kids, you know, all the medication issues and things with special diets. There's some kids that respond very well to special diets, especially if they have digestive issues, to things like the wheat-free and dairy-free diet. But it doesn't work for everybody. And it's going to be lovely when we can get tests where we can tell which ones it's going to work on. But there's definitely subgroups that, where it, it helps. Can you talk a little bit about dealing with life on an emotional level and interpersonal relationships? Well, I've got emotions, but they're simpler. Thing is, I'm a pure techie geek. And then there's going to be other individuals on the spectrum where more emotional circuits are hooked up. Well, I don't mean to always be selling books, but uh, in another book I did with Sean Barron called The Unwritten Social Rules, and Sean is different than me. There's some things about Sean that are very much the same. Uh, we had our fixations. His was school buses. When I was his age, it was election posters. I was just fascinated with <laughs> Whittier for governor posters and things like that in Massachusetts. And, and those were stuff that, that was the same. But he had more social circuits hooked up. He was really anxious to have a relationship. Now the thing is, you gotta learn a lot of relationship things like being in a play. Because I didn't know that people had all these little subtle cues with their eyes. I didn't know that until I was 50. And I read about that in a book. It's, there's certain social things, you know, there's certain emotional things where it's, I don't know, basically what I've done in my life is I've replaced emotional complexity with intellectual complexity. I'm happiest when we're figuring out how to build stuff. I'm happy when, when somebody says, well, your book enabled my kid to go to college. Or uh, 
one mom had read something in one of my books about acid reflux as a hidden painful medical problem in a little kid with autism, and they got that treated, and the kid could then sleep at night. That makes me happy. But there's, it's going to vary, because it varies depending on how many of the social circuits are hooked up. And, and I had to learn social things like, it's like being in a play. This is how you act in the play. And I can have emotions. And I had to learn how to control anger, because I got uh, kicked out of school for anger. And then when I went to the special school, I got in a big fist fight in the cafeteria, and they took horseback riding away for a week, so I switched to crying. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, a little secret I just learned in one of the business magazines, Steve Jobs cries. That's one of the reasons why he had a career. NASA space scientists cry when the shuttle's canceled. I saw that happen at a talk. It was very, very, very sad. You know, have emotions, but it's simpler. I can be really happy, I can be angry, I can be sad, I can be scared. Fear is my main emotion. The fear center is three times bigger. OK, where's the mic at now? OK. Hi, Temple. How are you doing? Um, hey, I, OK, so um, I own an agency. We serve individuals with autism. And I'm always looking for the right curriculum uh, to teach my staff, like, approach-wise. Uh, we, we've studied, like, Miller Method, RDI, uh, sunrise. The best like, teachers use a little bit of a whole lot of different things. Okay, that's all. I I'm have thinking. found that the best teachers, RDI starts to look like ABA and Miller starts to look like something else. The best teachers know how to be kind of gently insistent. There's good things in all the methods. Uh, I don't get too hung up on that. An effective teacher is a teacher that gets more language, gets more eye contact, teaches the kid, you know, basic skills. I'm appalled. The number of young, smart kids that can't shake hands properly. Just appalled at how they come up to the book table. Don't know how to shake hands. That's just ridiculous. I was taught that when I was six. Mother would have these dinner parties. And I had to go up and I had to shake hands with every single guest and then serve more d'oeuvres, and I wasn't allowed to monopolize the conversation. <laughs> you know, those were things that were just taught. Okay, wherever the mic is. I'm falling down. Dr. Grandin, um, you mentioned that your science teacher made such a difference in your life by being a mentor for you. I'm interested in being a mentor for my 13-year-old son with Asperger's, and what advice can you give me about how, how to is this, bring that Is this, first of all, is child fully verbal, working at grade level? Very much so. Okay, what is he good at? Well, he's good at art. He's good at art. <laughs> he is good at art. He's focused on a little bit of art. Do you know what I mean? Like, what do you mean a little bit of art? Well. Have you ever heard of manga? Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, he, he does his to... own kind of fake drawings, and they're always the same. Well, the much. thing is, we've got to broaden this out. Yes. When I was in fourth grade, all I did was drew horse heads, and I was encouraged to draw the entire horse, to draw other things. Mother encouraged me to do a watercolor of a beach, and she put it in a professional real frame. Now, I knew the difference between a refrigerator door and a real frame with glass. <laughs> What we've got to do with this art skill is we've got to broaden it out. Because when you go on a job, you can't just draw manga. You've got to draw other things. You've got to broaden it out. Another problem that some Asperger's have is perfection. If it's not perfect, they're destroying a lot of work that's very good, but it might not be perfect. And then you've got to show them that even in, let's take photography, for example. The National Geographic, if you were to go through and look at some of those pictures, you could find some mistakes in them. That's the pinnacle of photography, to work for the National Geographic. So even those photographers can have a few mistakes. Okay, for Time Magazine, it'd be a little lower standard. Home snapshots is like the really atrocious ones, telephone poles coming out of people's heads, <laughs> and, and the decent snapshots. But what I want to try to do is teach this kid some work skills. Is this kid do, doing any work skill things? Well, he needs to start doing some work outside the family. Paper routes, yard work for next door neighbors, maybe maintaining the church website and updating it, uh, making greeting cards and selling them, making PowerPoints for people, learning how to do things that other people want, walking dogs for other people. Got to do it every day, just like the paper route. I think we'll take about two or three more questions. I don't know where the mic is at now. It's right here. Dr. Grandin, um, I adopted a child six years ago, and she was 
diagnosed with short-term memory loss, dyslexia. She has, she's physically and mentally delayed by four years. And I'm trying to help her succeed in school and the school's getting frustrated with my child because she, when she gets upset at school or when she feels too overwhelmed, she starts crying. So what can I do to help her succeed well, in school? Well, when she starts crying rather than starts hitting. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm serious. That's actually a plus because the hitting when they grow up, that's the thing that's not tolerated in workplaces, it's not tolerated in, in lots, of different, um, lots of different places. I would have to talk to you. I, I can't troubleshoot this just in this short question. I need to find out where her problems, what she's good at in school, what she's bad at in school, what exactly is the actual problem. But maybe I can talk to you a little bit afterwards. I'm asking this with my grandson, who would like to know uh, what your average day is like and what you do for fun. Well, I like to go to movies, and uh, I went to say Cowboys and alien, Aliens, and I saw the Planet of the Apes movie. I'm a Star Trek fan, so I know about things like the Borg and stuff like that. <laughs> know all about that kind of stuff. That's stuff I like to do. For fan. I was an absolute Star Trek fan, and then my blind roommate was showing the movie. We would watch Star Trek on her, her radio that picked up a TV signal. Because we couldn't watch it down in the dorm lobby because Monday night football was always on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we'll do one more, one or two more quick ones, and then I'll be, we'll go outside. Where's the mic at? Uh, hello. Um, okay, I can't, I, I can't tell where it is. Um, okay. I've been diagnosed with Asperger's, ADHD, and I, have, I just came back from my IEP meeting, and I've been having trouble with motivation, and my parents have been very supportive of, of me. I'm just wondering that, you know, how you've been motivated and what you find works best. I'm here, and I'm looking for answers. And well, That's what motivated me was my teachers tapped into my interests. Uh, if you read my books and stuff and watch the movie, I got really fascinated by the cattle shoots and I built this squeezing machine device. And Mr. Carlock, my science teacher, said to me, well, if you want to learn why that's relaxing, then you're going to have to read all these scientific journals. So he takes me down to the library. We had to, couldn't do it at the regular school because they didn't have scientific journals and learn that you know, real scientists don't use encyclopedias, they use scientific journals. I had to learn what a scientific journal was. You see, and he tapped into my interest into why the pressure was relaxing and used that to get, make me learn physiology and learn a whole lot of other stuff. So starting out with your interests, what really turns you on? What do you like to do? You like Spanish? You told me you liked Spanish. Uh, well, I like computers and I like, you know, things that work well with myself, my condition, you know. Well, I like computers a lot because it's well, actually, it works on a basis of yes or no. Well, I think that one thing I don't like that's happening is I'm seeing too many guys, really smart guys, where autism is becoming their fixation rather than something like computers that can turn into a hobby and a job and something you can do with other people. People ask me all the time if I could snap my fingers would I not be autistic. I like the logical way I think, but I consider myself a college professor and a scientist and a designer first. Autism is secondary. And I'm saying way too many people. <laughs> where autism is becoming the, the primary thing. So, and as far as motivation goes, sometimes you gotta just sit down and you gotta do it. You gotta set aside a block of time, you know, okay, I gotta write this journal article. You know, all day Saturday, I'm gonna just work on writing this journal article. I gotta sit down, set aside a block of time, get rid of all the text messaging, get rid of all the phone calls and everything else, and you're gonna just do it. Okay, one more. And Dr. We'll Grannon, in okay. the very back. Um, I just wanna thank you for coming. I guess I picked the right time. I also have Asperger's, so um, I just really want to thank you for the charge that you've led for us. It's made me just pretty damn proud to have this disorder, well, to say the least. You got good company. Um, <laughs> uh, half of Silicon Valley's got the disorder. Yeah. 
but they don't want to be diagnosed. Uh, Steve Jobs I can talk about because he's deceased, mm -hmm. and I've gotten all the information out of publicly available documents <laughs> like his book, Business Week. You know, he was teased in high school. He had to switch schools because he was teased so much. But his dad brought him up, you know, doing hands-on things with automobiles, and, and uh, there were all kinds of neat people working in garages that served as mentors because he was right in the middle of Silicon Valley. So there was a lot of things that went right. I think we'll end on that. Find something you're good at. I already know what I'm good what at. What are you good at? I'm going to actually go into coaching college football. Okay. So. If you're good at that, then fine. Okay. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>